Cutting Out of Your Mind by Dr. Bob Rotella with Bob Cullen. Read by Dr. Bob Rotella. The Heart of the Game As the last twosome approached the 72nd green of the 1998 Nissan Open, not many people in Los Angeles gave my friend and client, Billy Mayfair, much chance to win. Tiger Woods, playing a group ahead of Billy, had just birdied the final hole to take a one-stroke lead. Tiger was charging. He had birdied three of the last four holes. The Nissan Open that year was played at Valencia Country Club, and the 18th hole was a long par 5. Billy had not birdied it all week, and he did not reach it in two strokes on this occasion. He hit his three-wood into a bunker to the right of the green. But Billy then hit a nice explosion shot to about 5 feet. He made that putt to force a playoff. Even then, it was all but assumed that Tiger would win the playoff which began on the same par 5. Tiger hits the ball much longer than Billy, whose length off the tee is about average for the PGA Tour. Even those who understood that good putting is much more important than length off the tee found reason to favor Tiger. Billy Mayfair has a very unorthodox putting stroke, the kind of stroke that television commentators love to criticize, love to say, won't hold up under pressure. That putting stroke was what initially brought Billy and me together. Billy grew up in Phoenix. From the time he started playing golf, he enjoyed putting. He had little choice. His parents weren't wealthy, and when they dropped him off at a municipal golf course called Papago Park, they couldn't give him money for greens fees or range balls. The only thing a kid could do for free at Papago Park was putt and chip around the big, crown practice green. So Billy did, five days a week after school. He developed into a very good putter. Even though he never hit the ball enormous distances, he won a lot of junior tournaments. He won the U.S. Public Links and the U.S. Amateur. He did all of this with the idiosyncratic putting stroke he developed at Papago Park. Billy did not take the putter straight back and bring it straight through the ball. He drew the club back outside the target line, the line he intended for the ball to travel as it left the putter blade. As he started his forward stroke, it looked as if he would pull every putt to his left. But at the last instant, Billy straightened his blade until it was perpendicular to the target line. And he made a lot of putts that way, even though the purist who saw him insisted he was cutting the ball, coming across it from right to left. Billy, of course, didn't grow up knowing many purists at Papago Park. All he knew was that he had a putting stroke that got the ball in the hole. When Billy got out on the tour in 1989, he did quite well. He made enough money to keep his playing card in 1989, and he moved up to 12th on the money list in 1990. But then he started to slip. He developed problems with his short game, especially his putting. One reason, Billy now thinks, is the way tour courses are equipped. Every one of them has a big practice range with grass tees. On every practice range, there is an unlimited supply of fresh golf balls. Real ones, not range balls. For a kid from Papago Park who could never afford to hit all the balls he wanted, this was all but irresistible. Billy started to spend more of his practice time working on his full swing. At the same time, he started to listen to the critics of his putting stroke. A player who starts spending too much time on his full swing and not enough on his wedges and chips will soon find himself facing longer putts for par. If they do this at the same time they're thinking about changing their putting stroke, thinking about taking the blade straight back and forth, they will soon find themselves in trouble. In fact, when Billy first came to see me in 1991, He told me he had developed a case of the yips. His scores were going up. He was in danger of losing his tour card. What he had, I thought, was not the yips. 
It was a case of misplaced priorities and a way of thinking that wasn't working on the putting green. I suggested that Billy stop trying to fix his putting stroke. It had never been broken. I told him I didn't care whether he cut the ball when he putted. I just wanted him to think about his target and let the putt go. I wanted him to rediscover the practice priorities he'd had as a kid and spend more time working on his wedges and his chipping. Billy did. He went on to win his first tour event in 1993 and to build a solid career for himself. He won the tour championship in 1995 at Southern Hills on some of the fastest grains in the country. All of that history was on my mind as I watched that Nissan Open playoff begin. I think it was on Billy's, too. I knew Tiger would have an advantage on a par 5, he told me later. But then he drove it into the rough, and I knew he wasn't going to be able to reach it in two. That meant the hole was probably going to be decided with wedge shots and putts. I thought to myself, Okay, Tiger, the game's on my court now. Billy drove into the fairway and hit his second shot about 85 yards from the green. Tiger couldn't reach the green from the rough. He left his second 30 yards away. Billy's wedge was lovely to watch. It hit about eight feet behind the hole and spun back, coming to rest about six feet away. Tiger hit his pitch past the hole and left himself a 15-foot birdie putt. Tiger's putt was a good one, but it slid past the hole. He sank to his knees, chagrined. Billy used the time he had while Tiger went through his putting routine. He walked around his putt, checked out everything he could see. But he had known from the time he stepped onto the green what his putt was going to do. It was not quite on the same line as the putt he'd made on the 72nd hole, but it was close. It would be uphill. It would be straight. Billy had the wisdom as he paced about and continued to inspect the green, not to let anything change this solid first impression. Then it was his turn. There are a lot of things he could have thought about. He could have thought about the fact that he had last won a tournament three seasons before. He could have thought about the statistics that show that tour players make only about half of their six-footers. He could have thought about his nerves. Fortunately, he didn't. Billy was experienced. He knew that the nerves that accompany a PGA Tour playoff were not something to fear. They were something to welcome. He knew that all the hours of practice had been spent precisely to help him get to a spot where his nerves would jangle. All I really thought about, he told me later, was making sure that I did my routine and saw my target well. I let the putt go. His target was just a bit to the right of the center of the hole. The ball rolled ponderously, but inexorably. It was dead straight. He knew from the instant he struck it that his touch had been good. He watched the ball cover the target point he'd chosen and fall into the cup. An instant later, pandemonium erupted, and Billy felt a deep sense of satisfaction. You don't get too many chances to beat Tiger, he told me. And when you do have a chance, you want to take it. I loved the way Billy handled the situation. He wanted to beat Tiger Woods, but he was able to discipline his thinking enough to shove that thought out of his field of focus, along with all the other distracting ideas. He thought only of seeing the target he wanted and letting the putt roll. That was why he made the putt. I recount this story not solely because I enjoy looking back on a triumphant moment for a nice guy who works hard at his game and deserves everything he gets, though I do. I recount it because it shows so much about the subject of this program, loving putting, enjoying putting, making putts, making putts that matter, making putts to win. Most golf instruction programs pay scant attention to putting. They start with the fundamentals of the full swing. They add putting as an afterthought. Some of the classics of instructional literature don't even address putting. I never thought about golf that way, in part because I came to golf after years spent in other sports. As the director of sports psychology at the University of Virginia, I coached athletes in the gamut of intercollegiate sports. When I started studying golfers, 
I noticed that even the great players didn't bring their best swings to the course more than half the time. But the great ones almost always found ways to turn in a low score anyway. They did it with their short game and their putting. No matter how skilled you are with the long clubs, you're going to make roughly 40% of your shots with your putter. The putting game is the place to look if you want to get a competitive advantage. The shave the stroke or so per round that makes the difference between making cuts and missing cuts, between winning tournaments and not winning them. The rule applies no matter what type of golf you play. Good putting helps your game the way a strong foundation works for a house. If you putt well, it's easier to hit your wedges and chips. If you hit your wedges and chips, you'll hit your flat irons more freely. And if you're confident about your irons, it will help your tee shots. I like to see players not only accept the importance of putting, but revel in it. Very few people manage to maintain that sort of attitude throughout their golfing careers. A lot of kids seem to have it. But there are socialization pressures at work in golf that want them to become cautious, careful, and eventually fearful about their putting. Over the many years of a golfer's life, it's easy to succumb. My job, with the players I work with personally, as well as with the listeners of this program, is to make sure that doesn't happen. It's to help you develop a great putting mind if you've never had one, and to help you preserve it if you grew up being a fine putter. It's to help you embark on a lifelong love affair with putting. With such a mind, you can become an excellent putter. Without it, you might as well stay on the practice range, because your real game is hitting balls. It isn't playing golf. Golf is a game of scoring. If you want to score, you must putt. If you want to score well, you must putt well. It's as simple as that. How Good Putters Think Golfers generally don't become my clients when they're playing the best golf of their careers. They come to me when they have problems with their games. Hal Sutton was no exception. Hal had once been touted as the successor to Jack Nicklaus. He won early in his professional career, and it seemed easily. At the age of 25, he led the tour in earnings and captured a major championship, the PGA. But after a time, the victory stopped, for many reasons. One of those reasons was putting. Hal was the sort of player who could hit the ball very accurately. He was usually near the top of the tour statistics in hitting greens in regulation. But once he got on the green, his thoughts tended to be less clear, less certain than they were on the tee or in the fairway. As I do with most players, I try to impress Hal with the importance of a routine for both long shots and putts. A routine that emphasized looking at the target and letting it go, that is, making the stroke freely and confidently. Hal intuitively grasped what I was telling him when it came to long shots. On the green, it was harder. One day I asked him to try a little experiment. We were in Charlottesville, Virginia, and we went over to the golf course at Keswick Hall, a resort outside of town. I asked Hal to play around with me using his normal routine for long shots. But on the greens, I wanted him to putt with his eyes not on the ball, but on the target. Hal was skeptical, but he agreed. He tried it on the practice green for half an hour. Then he putted the entire round with this altered routine. Normally, he would line himself and his club up, look at the ball, look at the target, look at the ball again, and stroke the putt. This time, he used the same routine, but instead of returning his eyes to the ball after his look at the target, he kept his gaze fixed on where he wanted the ball to go. He stroked the putt seeing the target, not the ball. The result is framed and hangs in the grill at Keswick Hall. It's a scorecard showing that Hal set the course record that day with a 63. Now, I'm not suggesting that anyone can set a course record if he putts with his eyes on the target instead of the ball. Hal never used this method in a tournament. It was an exercise to help him understand the feeling of being focused on the target just as much when he putted 
as he was when he hit longer shots. The exercise is helpful to a lot of players because it dramatizes the way good putters think. It focuses the golfer's attention where it should be, the target. Let's suppose, for a moment, that someone had invented a device that could read minds. You could aim this device at anyone's head, and a computer would print out what the individual was thinking. Here's what you might see if you aim this device at the head of someone who sees himself as a poor putter. My putter blade is a little offline. Let's adjust it. If I miss, I'll probably lose the hole. I've already three putted twice today. Don't want to do that again. Damn it, it's only four feet. I should make it. And so on. Here's what you might see if you aimed at the head of a good putter facing the same putt. My target is that little tuft of raised grass on the lip of the cup. And that's all you'd see. A lot of people, at this point, would look at this putative computer screen and object. Wait a minute, they'd say. That's all he's thinking? What is he, thick? No, the good putter is not thick, but he has a mind so quiet and so clear that it might strike many people as a bit obtuse. In putting, you want to narrow the focus of your thoughts as much as possible, to shut down a lot of the conscious thinking parts of the brain, the parts that give instructions. Putting is one of those physical tasks that are best left to the less intellectual, less rational parts of the mind. If you're putting, You'll make your best stroke and hold the most putts if you think only of your target. I don't know precisely why our bodies work this way. They simply do. I see evidence of it quite frequently. Little kids are often great putters because they simply pick up a putter and roll the ball at the hole. Older golfers sometimes dramatically improve their putting when they reach a stage in life when they don't worry so much about scores or competitions or anything else for that matter. They just like seeing the ball roll into the hole. Even professional golfers are prone to undermine their own putting with thoughts about their stroke, or making the cut, or keeping their card, or not three-putting. I see this fairly often with tour pros who let their minds wander from the target for the first 30 holes of a tournament. They might think that if they lose track of the score and don't worry much about whether the ball goes in the hole, they're not trying hard enough, not giving 100%. And how can they compete with Tiger Woods if they're not giving 100%? But it's pretty certain Tiger isn't thinking that way. In the clutch, at least, Tiger is thinking of the target. That's why Tiger's become one of the best clutch putters ever to play the game. As he demonstrated on the final day of the 2000 PGA Championship, when the tournament hangs in the balance, Tiger finds ways to make putts he doesn't necessarily make during the earlier rounds. I have a theory about why this should be the case. Tiger now is exposed to lots of different ideas about putting. I see and hear things that indicate he's listening to them. He'll talk, for instance, on the day before a tournament about how he's been working on the practice green, trying to make his ball roll in a particular way, a way that supposedly helps it hold its line and find the hole. But under pressure, we revert to our dominant habits. Tiger's dominant habit, as far as putting is concerned, was planted in his mind at a very early age by his father. Earl Woods has described how he taught Tiger to putt when Tiger was a toddler. Earl had Tiger put a ball in his right hand and roll it to a hole. Then he had Tiger close his eyes and roll it to the hole again. He asked Tiger what he'd seen after he closed his eyes. Tiger would reply that he'd seen a picture of the hole. Earl taught Tiger always to see that mental picture of the hole before he struck the ball with his putter. He taught him not to worry about the mechanics of the stroke, just to make sure he saw the target in his mind's eye before he putted the ball. He knew that Tiger's brain would take care of the rest more often than not. It was inspired instruction. When Tiger is in a clutch situation, when he falls back on his dominant habit, he's focusing tightly on his target, that picture in his mind. That's why he makes so many clutch putts. 
part of Butch Harmon's genius is that while he's worked on Tiger's full swing, he hasn't tried to change the putting concept Tiger got from his father. A lot of coaches might have fiddled with Tiger's stroke to the point that he got a new and less effective dominant habit. That might have kept Tiger from the success he's had. A good putter's target is never simply the hole. He's always trying to putt the ball into the hole, but the hole is much too big to serve as a good target. The smaller the target you have, the better your brain and body can function in trying to get the ball there. On short putts, you should pick out the smallest target you can focus on. It might be a blade of grass or a discoloration on the edge of the hole. It might be a scuff mark on the white liner inside the hole. I say that the brain and body can function well in reacting to a small target, not that they will automatically do so. Some people, as their targets get smaller, tend to get more careful in controlling with their stroke. They can make a free stroke easily if you tell them simply to putt the ball to nothing. But the smaller the target gets, the tighter they get. Putters have to discipline themselves to putt as freely to a small target as they do when they putt to nothing. On breaking putts, the choice of target varies with individuals, but the target generally won't be in, or in many cases, even near the hole. I'd teach any new player to make all putts straight putts. How do you do this? Suppose you think that the putt will break about four inches from right to left. Since four inches is the approximate diameter of the cup, measure one cup width from the edge of the hole to the right and pick out a blade of grass or a discoloration there. That's your target. Some very good players I've worked with have individual peculiarities in this aspect of their putting. If Nick Price has a putt he expects to break six inches, he aims six inches from the hole, but he looks at the hole just before he makes his stroke. Poor Harrington aims at a spot a foot or so in front of the ball. Somehow, Nick's subconscious mind gets the ball started where he's aiming, not where he's looking. Porrick's subconscious mind gets the ball rolling at the right pace even when he's looking at a target only a foot in front of him. The main thing is that they are both oriented to a target. Gaining control by giving up control. When I meet with new clients on a practice screen, it's generally quite easy to persuade them that clearing their minds and thinking only of their targets improves their putting. More often than not, a professional golfer with a clear mind and a focus on a target will hold nearly all of his five-footers, lots of 10 to 15-footers, and a fair number of even longer putts. He'll turn to me with a pleased smile and say, Gee, Doc, I putt really well when you're standing here. I never knew it could be this easy. It's not. All too often, that player who putted so well on the practice green will come in after his next tournament round with a 73 or 74 next to his name. He'll tell me that he can't understand what happened to his putting. I was trying hard, really hard, to clear my mind and think only of my target, he will say. But it didn't work. No matter how much I was grinding away at it, I still couldn't make any putts. As soon as I hear the word grinding, I have a good idea of what went wrong. Grinding is one of those concepts that is widespread in sport and unfortunately inimical to good putting. Grinding suggests that someone is doing his utmost to succeed. It suggests that he's trying to will the ball into the hole. I generally admire grinders and I believe in the transcendent importance of will. Free will is a precious, fundamental part of human nature, the part of which all true accomplishment is based. A strong will is very helpful in putting. Will helps you discipline yourself to eliminate distractions and pick out a target. But the application of will gets trickier when you are standing over the ball, ready to putt it. In fact, I believe that at that point, will can get in the way. The proper role for a strong will at this stage of putting is to support a firm belief in the golfer's mind that all the preparation is done and the ball will go in the hole if he turns control of the action 
over to his subconscious. But then free will must exit the stage and leave the scene to other actors. Paul Azinger is a great example. Long before he ever talked to me about his putting, Paul had been an extremely successful player, winning lots of tour events, a PGA championship, and contributing to some memorable and emotional Ryder Cup wins. He displayed the strength of his will again when he battled and defeated cancer. When we started working together, Paul told me that despite all his success, he'd never actually liked the way his putting felt. He felt that he had an artificial stroke, one that he mechanically forced into the pattern he'd been taught was classic, a short backswing, a long follow-through, and a putter head that accelerated through the ball. I told Paul that his putting didn't seem to fit with the rest of his game. When he was in a bunker, for instance, he hit beautifully athletic, relaxed shots that had more than once got into the cup to win a tournament for him. How, I asked, did he think about his bunker shots? It's like night and day from my putting stroke, he said. I don't think about it. I just look where I want it to go, splash the sand, and it goes there. Paul did not need me to spell out for him the obvious fact that if he wanted his putting to be as outstanding as his bunker play, he had to attain the same mental state on the greens that he had in the bunkers. He had to become relaxed, even nonchalant, at the moment of truth. I suggested that Paul think about gaining control by giving up control. This can be a hard concept to grasp. A lot of players respond to that by saying, huh? I remind them that even if they could somehow force their body to do everything perfectly, they still couldn't will the ball into the hole. There are just too many variables that are beyond control. The turf can be imperfect. The ball can be imperfect. The wind can gust. Any of these factors can cause a putt to miss. But the main reason trying too hard doesn't work is that it almost invariably diminishes the chance of making a good stroke. It introduces doubt to the mind. It tightens the muscles. It robs a player of his natural talent and destroys his rhythm and flow. Consider your signature. If you're signing checks on bill paying day, the likelihood is that each of your signatures is basically identical to the others. But suppose I were to hand you a blank piece of paper and say, here, sign this paper exactly as you sign those checks. If the signature doesn't seem genuine to an FBI handwriting expert, you owe me $10,000. The likelihood is that you would try very hard to make your signature identical to the one on the checks. And precisely because you were trying hard, it would not be. It would lack the casual flow your signature usually has. The lines would look wiggly, forced. It would look, in short, like a forgery. Putting is like that. Still, when I explain all this to a player and urge him to try gaining control by giving up control, the player sometimes gets the sense that I'm suggesting he not care. The answer, of course, is that I'm not asking players to stop caring. Minimizing the importance of a putt is much more helpful than maximizing it. Paul Azinger immediately grasped the idea of gaining control by giving up control. We started working on a few putting drills. I asked him to keep his eyes on his target as he began to draw his putter back. He did. I asked him to keep in mind the idea of gaining control by giving up control. He did. I could see the difference in his stroke. It was longer, but it didn't look artificial. Not long after that, Paul won his first tournament since his bout with cancer. He's playing very well now, and he's near the top of the tour's putting statistics. Other players grasp the concept in different ways. When I started working with Nick Price, one of the problems we confronted was that Nick felt his putting stroke was forced on putts in the 10-foot range. But he really liked his stroke and his mindset when he putted from 20 to 40 feet or more. The reason, of course, was that Nick felt he should make and had to make 10-footers. He didn't expect to make the longer putts. When he lined them up, he visualized them going into the hole but he could live with it if they didn't. So he stroked them more casually and better. It wasn't that he wasn't trying to make them. He was. 
but he relaxed on the longer putts because he didn't care so much. Nick and I worked on making him putt as if every putt was a 40-footer. That was one of the stories behind the story when Nick became Player of the Year in 1994. He was trying to putt everything as if it was a 40-footer. That's the way I like players to be about all their putts, even the short ones. Take your satisfaction not from whether the putt drops, but from whether you got yourself into the right frame of mind before you hit it. If you do that, you have done all you can. Making putts routinely. If you go to a PGA Tour event where my friend and client, Davis Love III, is playing, I suggest you stake out the practice screen and wait until he arrives. You'll be able to pick up a quick lesson in one of the elements that makes a good putter. I'm not talking about watching Davis's stroke, though it's a good one. Watch the number of balls he's hitting. He always practices putting with a single ball. After he hits it, he walks to it and either hits it again or picks it up and locates another target. Then he repeats the process. I point this out not because of any inherent magic in using a single ball on the practice screen, but because it illustrates Davis's commitment to his putting routine. That devotion to an unvarying routine is one of the hallmarks of a good putter. Davis, who is a very good putter, employs the same routine whenever he putts, whether it's in a practice round or on the final green at the Belfry with the Ryder Cup at stake. If you continue to watch Davis, you'll soon be able to predict exactly what he will do before he strokes each practice putt. You'll even be able to tell how much time will elapse between each movement he makes. A good putter's routine can be that predictable. Developing a good routine was one of the first things Davis and I worked on when we met years ago. He was in college, and his father, Davis Love Jr., was concerned that Davis wasn't putting or chipping as well as he needed to. Young Davis wanted to be a great player, but he didn't think he was much of a putter. I could see otherwise. Davis had talent as a putter, but as I told him, he was getting in his own way. Most golfers face a constant battle to stay out of their own way. One of their allies in this struggle is a strong putting routine. A putting routine has two intertwined components. One is the physical activity, taking the grip, taking the stance, practice swings, etc. The second and more important component is the mental activity, reading the green, deciding on the line, clearing the mind, putting to make it, and accepting the results. It wasn't hard to persuade Davis about this. We just watched some sports on television. If you look closely at them, you can see that successful athletes in many situations, similar to a golfer's, rely on habit and routine. We watched Michael Jordan and Mark Price shoot free throws. They each had a ritual way of taking the ball from the referee, taking their stance, warming up by dribbling or spinning the ball in their hands, taking aim, and letting the shot go. Both Jordan and Price moved decisively at the moment of truth. They looked at the target and let the shot go without delay. It was much the same when we watched Larry Bird win the NBA's three-point shooting contest. Larry grabbed the balls off the rack quickly and decisively. He focused on the target and let the shots go without wasting time. There was no sign that he cared about his shooting form. Davis still had trouble thinking of himself as a good enough athlete to apply this idea to putting. I had him toss a ball to me. Unconsciously, of course, he tossed it precisely into my hand. That shows you're athlete enough to putt, I said. Now you have to trust that a very smart engineer designed your putter to fit in your hands, to hit the ball straight. You shouldn't have to think about that any more than you think about your hand when you toss me the ball. In fact, you can putt a lot better with your putter than you can rolling the ball with your hand. Davis set about mastering a routine that captured his athleticism. It took hundreds and hundreds of repetitions before it became unconscious and automatic. But once Davis makes a commitment to something, he sticks to it. That's why he began working with a single ball on the practice screen, and why he always practices the same rhythmic core of his routine. He looks at the target, 
he looks at the ball, and he strokes his putt as soon as his eyes come back to the ball. It's a routine designed to maximize the chance that he will putt with no extraneous thoughts getting in his way. Not coincidentally, Davis transformed himself from a young man who didn't think he was much of a putter to a mature player who was perennial near the top of the tour's putting statistics. Some people will react to this by thinking, that's crazy. I play all the time with guys who have elaborate putting routines that they always follow and they putt poorly and can't break 90. Well, then evidently, they are not employing the sort of routine I'm talking about. Players who move their bodies through routine but fail to get their minds where they must be are like people who go to church every Sunday but sit there thinking about work, school, sex, or golf, anything but faith and prayer. It's the mental part of a routine that's more difficult to master. That's not to say that a consistent physical routine isn't helpful. It is. Body and mind are part of a unified system, and a sound set of physical habits can promote and support sound mental habits. The main thing is to have a physical routine that feels comfortable and effective to you. Then stick with it. At the core of the routine, though, are some physical movements that I think are less open to individual interpretation. When the moment of truth comes, I like to see players look at the target, look at the ball, and let the stroke go, with no delay between those three movements. When I see a player who looks at the target, looks back at the ball, and then freezes, I can generally guess what's going on in his mind. He's given himself a lecture on the putting stroke. For every instant frozen over the ball, the golfer is less likely to simply see it and do it. The mental routine can actually begin before a player arrives on the green when the player begins to read his putt. The eyes and the mind of a good player start to process information about a putt almost as soon as his approach shot stops moving. As he strides up the fairway toward the hole, his imagination comes into play. He sees the general contour of the land, and he starts to envision how his ball will be affected when he rolls it. Much has been written over the years about reading putts. Some of it is no doubt valid, but a lot of it is pseudoscience at best. One thing I do know is that I've seen a lot of putts missed because golfers' heads were churning with so much information about how to read greens that they were unable to focus on their targets. Kids who are new to the game seem to know better. I attend a fair number of junior golf tournaments, and I can tell you that kids read greens remarkably well. And they know nothing about grain, drainage, or any of the other supposed fine points of reading putts. They just take a look and whack it. They putt well in that unsophisticated way because they tend to go with their first impression of how the putt will break. If I have a cardinal rule about reading greens, that's it. Your first impression of how a putt will break will be right more often than any other impression you might form. That doesn't mean you must read the putt the instant you step onto the green. Cindy Fig Courier, who plays on the LPGA Tour, has a useful metaphor in this regard. She tells me, that she thinks of reading putts as a process similar to focusing a camera. Once you've got it clear, you stick with it. That's the way you should read putts. I like to see players make their reads fairly quickly. Once in a while, with a long putt on a modern green that has some artificial humps, tiers, and ridges, it may be advisable to walk around a putt and see it from both sides of the hole. Do it only if you're certain that you're trying to find a way to get the ball in the hole, not looking for reasons why that's going to be hard to do. And don't do it very often. Most putts aren't that complicated. That's not to say that you should rush through this phase of your routine. Davis Love plays a brisk round of golf. But Davis is so committed to his routine that he takes pride in stepping away and starting over if he fails to execute the mental portion of it if he's distracted by thinking of something other than the ball going in the hole. He's got such a disciplined mind that it doesn't happen very often. Players who are putting well find it easier to observe this principle than players who aren't. David Duvall tells me that when he shot his remarkable 59 in the final round of the Bob Hope Classic a couple years ago, he barely looked at the final seven-foot putt he had to make eagle 
to win the tournament and to break 60. He just got an instinctive idea of how the ball was going to roll, picked out his target, and hit it there. Some players intuitively understand the advantage of trusting their first impression of a putt, the read that feels instinctive. But many don't. Sometimes a player will tell me, Yeah, Doc, but the hole locations out in the tour are chosen because they're in the places where your first impression is usually wrong. They're subtle. They're hard to read. That's sometimes true. We've all seen greens on television where player after player misreads the putt the same way. Everyone plays the putt to break left, but it stays straight. Or vice versa. If I saw evidence that players who reread the greens got that sort of putt in the hole and players who went with their first impression missed it, I might reassess my belief in the value of putting by that instinctive first impression. But I don't. I don't see any evidence that the second and third reads are any more accurate than the first. Players with strong putting routines tell me that they feel as if they're stepping into their own little world. Their awareness of the things around them fades as their focus on the putt they're facing tightens and intensifies. The climactic part of a good routine is very simple. Putt to make it. Unfortunately, people putt not to three putt. They putt to give themselves a good leave for their next putt. They putt not to go too far past the hole. They putt not to leave it short. You must learn to putt to make it. Seve Ballesteros, a two-time Masters champion, once four-putted a green at Augusta. He was asked about it later in the media center. I putt and miss, I putt and miss, I putt and miss, I putt and make, Seve explained. People laughed, but it suggested to me something about the way Seve's mind worked. Seve's answer suggested that he was completely in the present moment on each of those putts. He didn't say that the greens at Augusta were slick and treacherous. He didn't ruminate about the iron shot that may have left him with a tough first putt. His attitude hadn't changed from one putt to the next. He wasn't affected by his misses. He had had four putts. He'd tried to make each of them. He'd succeeded on the fourth. He had done all a golfer can do. That's why, in his prime, he was such a great player. Good putters don't four-putt very often, but no matter how good you are, you are going to miss some putts, most likely ten or more during every round you play. A smart response to those inevitable misses is the last major element in a good routine. You must be resilient about missed putts. Remember that it's how you respond to your misses that matters, not whether you miss. You can choose to be angry about your misses, or you can choose to accept them. I much prefer a player to react calmly to a missed putt, even two of them on the same green. Golf is a game of mistakes, and that makes it a game that will beat you up mentally if you let it. The only constructive thing you can do about a missed putt is to forget it. That way, you can be free and confident on the next one. Your routine after making a putt isn't so problematic. It's fine to be happy if you hold one. Feeling the emotion helps cement the memory in your mind, and you want to remember your successful putts. You can overdo it, of course. I don't see too many successful players who go bonkers when they hold a long birdie putt, even in a clutch situation. Most people who become good at golf have learned that it's best to maintain a low, consistent level of intensity through good shots and bad, because the calmer you are and the quieter you keep yourself, the easier it is to play the game. Putting in the Clutch The cliché in discussions of pressure is to point out that pressure doesn't really exist. None of us is going to starve or die if we miss a putt. We're not going to lose our families, our houses, or anything else that's truly important if we miss the putt. As I sometimes tell players, a billion Chinese could care less whether their putts fall. But so what? The fact is that we do care, 
we do put pressure on ourselves, and pressure can complicate the process of making a putt. It's said that golfers who putt well under pressure have ice water in their veins, or they don't feel nervous. That's just media baloney. Great pressure putters have the same nerves, the same glands, and the same emotions that plague the 20 handicap player in your foursome who always manages to blow the decisive three-footer. It's how they respond to nervous jitters that distinguishes them. Part of this is physical, but the larger part of it is mental. When a player who has a sound routine reverts to his or her dominant mental habit under pressure, it helps dispel distracting thoughts. Good putters learn to welcome nervous symptoms rather than fear them. Nerves are something they don't feel during practice rounds. Nerves are something they feel when the stakes are high. They understand that nerves are a challenge, but they want to meet that challenge head on. That is how great players distinguish themselves on the green in clutch situations. They don't rely on tricks or gimmicks. They don't have superhuman control of their bodies. They don't avoid the churning stomach, the sweaty brow, the trembling hands. They simply do better than their competitors at enjoying the challenge, following their putting routines, locking their minds in the present, and putting to make it. Speed. The light is always green. Once in a while, I work with a player who tells me he has no touch. When someone tells me this, I usually respond by tossing them a ball. They catch it, and I ask them to toss it back. Without thinking about it, they toss it precisely into my hands. That's amazing, I say. Your toss reached my hand exactly right. I didn't have to reach out for it. It didn't come in hard enough to sting me. I could just catch it. Then I play the same game of toss and catch with an unfamiliar object, like an ashtray or a stuffed animal. Instinctively, the player adjusts to the weight of the new object and tosses it the correct distance. That shows that you have good touch, I tell him. Your problem isn't that you don't have touch. Your problem is that you're worrying about speed instead of putting to make it. The last thing you want to do if you're trying to make putts is worry about speed. Your brain, eyes, and nervous system are marvelously equipped to roll the ball at the right pace if you just let them respond naturally. It's not that speed isn't important in making putts. It is. A player controls just two things when he putts a golf ball, line and pace. There are a few putts, the straight ones, where line is much more important than pace in determining whether the ball goes in the hole. But on breaking putts, the right line has to be married to the right speed. One doesn't work without the other. If you don't understand this, try a little game that one of the best putters in the world, Brad Faxon, plays on the practice screen. Brad takes three balls and finds a putt of about five feet with a moderate break. He then makes the putt at three different speeds. Hit firmly, the ball breaks very little and the correct line is inside the hole. Hit at medium pace, the ball breaks more and the correct line is perhaps a couple of inches outside the hole. Hit softly, the ball breaks quite a bit. Brad makes it plop over the side of the cup, dying into the hole. If you try this game a few times, it will reinforce the knowledge that there is no uniquely correct line for most putts. Line is usually a function of speed and vice versa. You'll start to see putts a little differently when you line them up. You'll be able to imagine several ways the ball might roll into the hole, and you'll begin selecting not only your line, but your speed. But the fact is that Brad Faxon, like nearly all the other good putters I know, never consciously thinks about speed when he's putting. He trusts his touch. When he reads a green and picks out a line, he's also thinking, subconsciously, of a speed that will make that line the correct one. When he strokes the ball, he's thinking about rolling it on the line he selected, rolling it on the line that will take it into the hole. He lets the speed take care of itself, 
Nearly all the time, it does. The proper pace of a putted ball has engendered more miss in hogwash than almost anything else in golf. Few people, I suspect, get through their first round of golf without hearing the adage, never up, never in. It makes it seem as if the goal in putting is not to get the ball in the hole, but to roll it past the hole. I'm sorry, but a miss is a miss, whether it runs a foot past the hole or stops a foot short. Good players know that if they're trying to roll the ball into the hole softly, it's possible that it will stop a bit short of the hole. If it does, it's a mistake like any other. They simply go on. The never up, never in concept, mistaking though it is, is nevertheless a model of lucid thinking in comparison to the notion of the green light putt. The idea of the green light putt, I suppose, is that this is a putt that the player can safely try to make. This implies that there are red light putts, putts that are too fast, too slippery to try to make. The people who advance the notion that there are green light putts and red light putts tend to be, I find, people whose bad putting forced them into alternative careers as broadcasters. The truth is that every putt is a green light putt. The Myth of the Perfect Stroke and the Perfect Roll What I'm about to say will be as popular in some quarters as an assertion that Earth has never been visited by extraterrestrial beings and there are no white alligators in the New York City sewer system. Even though the evidence would support my statement, there are a lot of people who would prefer to think otherwise. But I'll come out and say it anyway. There is no such thing as perfect putting mechanics. There is no perfect way to roll the ball. The stories you may have heard or read about the perfect stroke or about hole hunting spin are golf's equivalent of tales about UFOs and albino alligators. If you're a player who believes in perfect roll, try this experiment. The next time you're out at your golf course, take a striped range ball over to the practice green. Squat down about 20 feet away from the hole. Roll the ball toward the hole using your hand instead of a club. Try to give it the most violent side spin you can, like a baseball pitcher throwing a curveball. The stripe will allow you to see the ball spin better than you could with a normal ball. What you'll see is that the side spin lasts for a few feet at most. Then it dissipates. The ball rolls end over end, as it were. It has topspin. Then try it with a putter. Hit the ball toward the hole, putting as much side spin on it as you can. You will find that you can't put nearly as much side spin on the ball with your putter as you could with your fingers. The spin you can put on the ball is infinitesimal. You probably won't even be able to see it. So what would happen if you were trying to hit the ball straight with no side spin? Side spin would play no role at all in how the normal putt behaved. The fact is that the ball is round and it's going to roll in the direction you hit it. High-speed video of golfers putting strokes confirms this. The films show that side spin dissipates so quickly that it's basically irrelevant in determining where the ball goes on putts of more than a foot or so. They show that you don't have to worry about overspin. The laws of physics will give the ball overspin if you just hit it toward your target. Nor is there any evidence I've seen to support the proposition that a certain kind of spin helps the ball fall in the hole. Speed can help determine whether a putt goes in. A ball rolling slowly is more likely to drop along the edges of the hole than a ball rolling quickly. But by the time the ball reaches the hole on a putt, it's going to be rolling in the direction you hit it, modified by the break of the green. It can't do anything else. Speed and line are the only factors at work in deciding whether it falls. If, despite this, a golfer stands over a putt and thinks, I want to put overspin on the ball, he's doing two things. First, he's trying to do something entirely superfluous. Second, and more important, the golfer who's thinking about overspin isn't thinking about his target. 
Golfers today are inundated with information and pseudo-information about the mechanics of putting. Golfers put stock in this information, I think, because it's more comfortable to believe that their stroke is flawed than that their mind is weak. A flawed stroke, after all, is something that can be blamed on bad instruction or bad coordination. A flawed mental approach edges uncomfortably close to a character issue in some players' minds. The idea that there is a single correct way to putt is about as valid as the idea that there is a single correct way to write. Where would we be if all of us were told that the only way to write was to copy Shakespeare? We would be without a host of great writers, from Mark Twain to E.E. E. Cummings. The same goes for putting mechanics. If, after listening to this program, you nevertheless feel that your putting needs work, try this. Go to the practice green and try to make some four-foot putts, the kind that you're probably missing on the golf course. If you can make the four-footers on the practice green but not on the course, then your problem isn't your stroke. If you can't make the four-footers on the practice green, then maybe your mechanics do need work. If so, there are a few things that you can do to help prevent your stroke improvement effort from undermining your putting. First, go to a good teacher and take a lesson in putting mechanics. Determine the fundamentals you plan to incorporate into your putting game. Commit yourself to staying with them. This means that for the foreseeable future, you are going to putt with the grip, the stance, and the posture you and your teacher agreed on. Second, practice it off the golf course. When you're on a putting green, putting a hole, you want to be completely focused on getting the ball into that hole. Imitation of other players can be a better way of improving your stroke. This mimics the natural process that kids go through when they pick up a game by watching older people do it. It bypasses all the lectures about mechanics that usually accompany putting lessons and therefore it poses less danger to your mental putting routine. Practice to get better. My friend and client Bill Sheehan had a rough time on the greens during the qualifying rounds of the most recent U.S. Senior Amateur Championship. Bill is a crackerjack senior golfer. In 1998, he won the U.S. Senior Amateur in his first year of eligibility. Nine months later, he won the 1999 British Senior Amateur. Not bad company for a guy who sells insurance for a living and plays little or no golf from November to April each year. But at this championship, the Greens were giving Bill trouble. The tournament was held at the Charlotte Country Club in North Carolina, an old Donald Ross layout that had been reworked by Robert Trent Jones. The Greens were deep and narrow, with plenty of swales and tears. And during the early part of the tournament, they were still wet from several days of rain. Wet greens can be harder to figure than dry ones. Greens don't hold moisture equally over their entire surface. Some areas, because of drainage and exposure to the sun, dry faster than others. That may have been why Bill misjudged a couple of putts badly early in the first round, rolling them eight or ten feet past the hole. He was surprised when his two-round total of 157 made the field of 64 players for match play. He was barely under the cut line. Because of the rain delays, there was no overnight break between the end of the qualifying rounds and the first round of match play. Bill had three hours before his first round match. He decided to use that time to practice in an effort to regain confidence in his touch, his ability to judge the pace on the tournament greens. But Bill did not, as many golfers would, spend those three hours putting several balls to a distant hole on the green. He knows that one of the guiding principles of effective practice is that you don't put balls to holes so far away that you can't make the vast majority of the putts you try. Bill did what I would recommend to anyone who wants to practice to sharpen his sense of pace and touch. He putted to the edge of the practice green. He took a few balls onto the green. 
He selected lines that offered some complications, side slopes, downhill, uphill. He putted a single ball along each line he selected. He went through the core of his routine with each one. His goal was to make each ball stop precisely on the border between the green and the fringe. As time passed, his putt started to do so more and more often. Gradually, he rebuilt his confidence in his touch. When match play began, Bill's putting was transformed. Despite having barely made it through qualifying, Bill went all the way to his second U.S. Senior Amateur Championship, putting well the entire time. I have observed a lot of practice regimens. I think there are a few guidelines that will help most, if not all, putters. First and foremost, when you practice with a ball in a hole, always putt to make it. A lot of the good players I've seen and worked with emphasize short putts in their practice routines. When David Duval practices putting, he works most of the time from two to six feet. You might think that putters of David's caliber would practice from longer range because, after all, they're already very good at shorter putts. But they continually practice short putts for a number of reasons. Practicing from close range assures them of making most of the putts they try. There's nothing better for your confidence and your putting than seeing balls go in the hole time after time. If you're solid from, say, two to five feet, it makes it so much easier to make your longer putts. You can stroke them more confidently when you know that if by some misfortune you do miss, you're a cinch to sink the next one. I think practicing for touch and pace is best done without a hole. When you practice for touch and pace, you're going to have to vary your distance to the target from perhaps three feet all the way back to 40 feet. That's why I recommend the drill Bill Sheehan used, putting to the fringe. If you don't like that, stick a tee in the turf and putt to it. I like to see players turn putting practice into a game. At the clubs I visit, I've seen countless variations of a game. Everyone in this contest putts toward a hole perhaps 30 feet away. If someone gets the ball in the hole, he instantly wins two units from everyone else in the game. The player whose first putt is furthest from the hole has a choice. He can either attempt his second putt or pass on it. If he passes, he loses one unit to everyone. If he tries and misses, he loses two units to everyone. If he tries and makes it, there's no blood. The loser chooses the next putt, and the game starts again. This is a good practice game because it puts a premium on getting the ball into the hole. It introduces competitive pressure. This kind of game will help you find the seemingly paradoxical place where most good putters' minds reside. They hit practice putts as if they were in a tournament, and they hit tournament putts as if they were practicing. That's effective practice. How you'll putt from now on. Now you know what it takes to be a good putter. The question is, how will you apply what you know? What kind of commitment are you prepared to make to it? I sometimes run into people who have read one of my earlier books, most notably, Golf is Not a Game of Perfect. And sometimes one of these readers will say, the stuff in that book worked great for a while, Doc. I was really playing well. But it doesn't work so well anymore. When I have a chance to talk with one of these people, it becomes clear that the stuff in the book isn't the problem. Commitment to it is the problem. When the book was fresh in their minds, they trusted their swings, they managed their golf games intelligently, they disposed of anger on the golf course. They did a lot of things right, and their scores showed it. But with time, their old habits of thought reasserted themselves. The principles of putting in this program will work too but only if you apply them for an extended period of time, say six months to a year. 
And they'll continue to work for as long as your commitment stands. They'll stop working if your commitment fades. Making a commitment is easy. Keeping it is hard. There are going to be times when you miss putts you think you should have made. There are going to be times when those missed putts will cost you a match or a title you dearly wanted to win. That's when keeping a commitment begins to get really hard. Instead of asking, how many times did I putt this round, you need to ask, how many times did I putt without executing my mental routine? How many times did I fail to simply see it and do it? If the answer is never, then the number of putts you actually took is irrelevant. Don't think of this commitment as a porcelain vase that once broken can never be put together again. I don't know of any player whose mind is always where it ought to be. Every player I've ever worked with has had occasions when he's putted in fear or doubt, when he's tried to steer the ball into the hole. Good players recognize when their commitments waver, and they set things right quickly. They constantly recommit themselves. But while keeping your commitment to good putting won't be easy, neither Will it be like keeping a commitment to go to the dentist twice a year? Putting well is fun. 